time and uh, uh, both your time, um, well, mostly your time. Uh, my time is, is yours. Uh, so I want to make sure that we get um, everything done, and uh, I want to make sure that you get the most out of today. So let me show you a couple of things that I've been doing, and then let's, let's start talking on a different subject. Um, is the sound feeding OK? Looks like it. Yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, while you guys were at break, I took all the tabs. Remember how the tabs are all totally crazy up there? And they're all gone because I put them all here on the wiki page. Uh, so if you want to find out what Cozy is or Shutterfly or that cord cutting article, you can just link through here. This is, I, I just find, this is a practice that I wasn't trained in in grad school. And that um, the one pass-fail small class I took on pedagogy in grad school never mentioned. But um, I think it's vital to capture what goes on in a discussion as much as possible. Um, and I love doing that. And I love encouraging other people to do it as well. Uh, my favorite crazy example of this is I, I taught a three-hour workshop on digital storytelling with a multinational audience. And at the end of it, we had a wiki page. And this one really quiet guy in the back said, could you please reload the page? All right, I reload the page. At the very bottom of it was a link. It says, click here for my video. I click there. And the guy in the back, while we were doing everything, talking about multitasking, has shot video of the three-hour workshop, edited it, compressed it, and put it online. Had missed a step, and it was all there. I mean, I thought, wow, thanks. <laughs> kind of creepy. But, um, but so you, know, you get everybody else to add stuff as well. But this is all here. And I think this is a good practice. Um, I mean, think about scholarly conferences. Uh, the question and answer periods are sometimes better than the uh, presentations. And in fact, they're, they're what you should be there for. Because the presentations you can get anywhere, right? But to capture that, I think, is vital. And you can do it with video or audio. And we talk about this a little bit this afternoon. But I think this is really easy to do. Uh, and I learned a lot from it myself. I broke out a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned academia.edu, and someone mentioned Socrative. Um, I forget who meant. Yeah. And so I pulled them out under the subheader academic tech, um, because although they do bleed into your normal life a little bit, they're still primarily for the job. But these are all uh, personal technologies. Here's another thing that happened. Um, you guys have all heard of Twitter, right? If you haven't used it, you know how, you know. One of the things that I find fascinating about Twitter is. Uh, do you know the Library of Congress archives Twitter now? It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Because among other things, whatever you think of the content of Twitter, just take a, a scroll down its front page. Now, this is actually a case where I think they handle privacy well, where when you start a Twitter account, you can decide to make it private or public. So if it's public, everyone in the world who wants to can see it. If it's private, only people who you allow see it can. Um, so a lot of teenagers will do this, a lot of private accounts so only their friends can see it, not their parents. Right? Um, but if you scroll through Twitter's front page, you're getting a, a weird kind of snapshot of what the human race is thinking about at this moment. Now, there's another snapshot that Google does called Zeitgeist. I don't know if you've seen this. I, I recommend it when I'm kind of sentimental at New Year's, and I love looking at what they've done. But what they do at the end of the year is they summarize everything that people have thought about through Google during that year. And it's, it's pretty mind-boggling. And you can go back in time. So for me, the, looking at 2001 is pretty amazing. Like rising trends, search for bin Laden, for example, or World Trade Center. But this gives you a snapshot of what humans are thinking. But if you go to Twitter, you get this fire hose of little things. The US considering training Syria rebels. A friend of mine likes being in Vermont. Good for him. Um, pictures. So imagine going back to 1925, if Twitter were around. Wouldn't it be awesome to take a look at the front page of Twitter for a given day? You know, 1929, when the stock market crash happened. Imagine that. So looking at Twitter, that's one use that's kind of fun and interesting. No, you can, if you go to Twitter.com and you don't sign in, you can still look at some of the public stuff that's there available, which is handy. Um, having a Twitter account is useful, but you don't have to. So this looks kind of ungainly, but don't worry. This is pretty, this is pretty slick, actually. 
This is a program called TweetDeck, which lets me take Twitter feeds and arrange them. So here, for example, this, is ever, this column is everyone who has tweeted at me. See, in a tweet, if you include the at somebody, you're talking at them. You're throwing something at them. So here, I get to have all these different responses back. So here is Andrea McEachron. Pronounce that last name again. McEachron. See, it looks Irish, and, and Irish Gaelic goes crazy with pronunciation. So all those vowels, do it again. McEachron? McEachron. So you're very nice to meet you. Hello, good to see you. I, I mentioned we're talking about personal technologies. So somebody asks, very sarcastically, what are they talking about? Buggy whip, rotary form? No, no, they're talking about bleeding edge technology. You guys are. And then Courtney gets all meta, tweeting about Brian Alexander, talking about Twitter. And then um, Manya T, where'd you go, Manya? Hello, just join me. So I can follow this little conversation. And I say little because there's only a few tweets. Where? Ah, Margaret Spriggs, see? This is beginning to fill up, right? But what you can do, this is called a back channel. This is a conversation that can happen that isn't right here. So in a class, you can have students do this. And you can get a kind of parallel conversation. And yeah, you might not want to see some of it. It can be horrifying. Um, but but you, as a teacher, you can shape that. So you can give an assignment, or you can just harvest it, or deal with it. You know, uh, people do this with presenters and presentations. You can follow a conference from afar and see what people are talking about in that conference. And then you can participate by using the same hashtag. I also, this is just a practice, I search for my name because people will tweet at me and forget to use the at sign. So I get that as well. But then you can set up a column for different things. This is a column of people who are unusually provocative thinkers about technology and education. I just follow them, just carve out that list. Here are futurists that I like. I'm a politics junkie, I know, I need help. Um, and here are people who tweet about politics that I follow. So this is a kind of way of getting my feeds of the day and I can engage with people this way. Yeah, please. What are you getting? Not found. Well, might be. It might be. Now, now iPads sometimes have problems editing this wiki platform. I can't even see it. Well, um, try t try typing it again. You don't mean this. You mean the the, the wiki page. The wiki page. Yeah. Did you try? Or using the shortened one or the long one? Oh. And neither of them worked for you. Let me reload it. Make sure it's still there. Yeah. Well, pass it over to this guy. Make him type it in. <laughs> has everyone else been? Has, is everyone else able to at least see it yeah, if they look for it? It's there. This could be a typo. Just do the tiny, the tiny one. Yeah, try the tiny one. That should work. So wait, these are these are small examples of using technology with with people, and this can be with students. This can be with other faculty in a meeting. This could be with faculty in a professional society. Um, I find multitasking is especially fun during public government meetings because you can check what your council members are saying online. They don't respect this very much, but it is good democracy, I find. OK, so let's address one major issue right now. Information overload. So you guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with this feeling that there is way too much information for you to track, right? This isn't an unusual idea for you. I will make things better and worse for you at the same time. We are not the first humans to have this experience. Uh, there is a terrific book and also a journal article or journal issue about this problem and when it was first documented. And I'm afraid to say it was first documented in the 15th century. So Anne Blair has a whole book on this. Uh, and there's a special issue of the Journal of the History of Ideas which finds this. And I find this both depressing and exhilarating. Did you succeed? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Um, try the, see if you try editing it, let me know what happens. Because again, there's iPad issues with that sometimes. D don't rush it. But, but here's the interesting problem. 
You can read scholars from 1400 through 1750 talking about how there are so many books to read and how they'll never get to them all. And there are these new things, these journals. How can we keep up with all of this? Um, and you can find them in all kinds of countries, mostly in Europe uh, and the United States. Um, China had a solution to this, which isn't good, which is to restrict the total number available. Um, I, would, I would look at this if you're, if you're looking for inspiration, but also just so you don't feel totally bad that humans have dealt with this before. Uh, in fact, we're the, who's the, who does the English Renaissance? Who is that? Who's the scholar here who works in the English Renaissance? I can't remember. Someone, well, there's a great poem called The Fairy Queen. In the middle of The Fairy Queen, a heroic knight runs into a monster called Error. There's a lot of allegory. And he's fighting with Error, the dragon. And at one point, Error rears up and vomits on him. What does he throw up? Books. Pamphlets, journals, broadsides, big books, little books. Because in the great period of the Reformation, books helped power the Reformation. You hear stories about uh, certain sizes of books that were printed so that people could smuggle them under their clothes. You, know, you hear about fights over the Bible and translations of the Bible. So if you go, you look at some of the early uh, Lutheran translations of the Bible, the footnotes will have things like, and by the way, this is why the Pope is the Antichrist. And if you read early or early Reformation era Catholic Bibles, they'll say the same thing about Luther back and forth. Um, but what's fascinating about all this is that we adapted. We came with new technologies and new practices. So you go to the 1700s, this is when the encyclopedia was invented. And if you look at the records of the first encyclopedias, the English encyclopedia, the French encyclopedie, they're all about people who have too much to read. That's why they came about. And in fact, it's kind of fun to look at the reception of the encyclopedia in 1750, 1760. It was considered dangerous, it was considered offensive, it was considered punk rock and obnoxious. And now, what? The encyclopedia is the most traditional thing we can think of. Um, in 1800s, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge publishes The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And in his second edition, he wants to make it look old, older. He adds marginal glosses. Because that was something invented in the 1600s to help you read. So we do these things. So let me ask, now, in 2013, what are some of the things that you do to handle information overload? I'm going to recommend a couple, but what do you do now? Yeah, please. Well, I use Google Drive. Uh, well, I'm not sure that handle or like All right. create information overload. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of, a lot of material that I work with. Um, I just use a lot of data, a lot of information. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let me ask. Do, that's a that's a really useful example. Let me ask before I go further on that one particular point. Um, do all of you have Google email for your institution? Personal use, yeah. I don't, I don't know if you've, if you've heard of this. There's been a growing move. Google will support email for schools for a fee. Um, and, and it's usually called Google Apps for Education. So, uh, so it doesn't necessarily look like Google Mail at first. You can brand it with your school. But it is, it's Gmail. Um, a lot of campus IT departments will go to the students first. Remember I was talking about the next generation? Because Google Mail is a huge win for IT because it's basically outsourcing it. It's way cheaper and it's a lot more reliable because their Google IT is world class. They're, 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 you know, they're super powered. You know, they have buildings for this. right? Um, but then they're often afraid of giving this to faculty. So they'll do it to the students first, and then maybe to staff, and then outflank them and eventually sneak it in. But because moving faculty to new technologies is seen as more difficult than moving students. And students don't have a vote in the matter, but faculty, depending on the institution, have governance. Um, and so it really depends. It's a great question. It's a great question. Students are more like, you know, they prefer 
non-institutional emails anyway. So. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? <laughs> they, they prefer non-institutional yeah, emails. You have, we have, like our students have a CAU account, but uh -huh. don't try sending them an email because they'll be like, oh, I didn't get it. Well, you know, when's the last time you checked your CAU email? Check it? I have to check it? <laughs> So, but if I send it to their personal email, boom, instant response. So this is, this is, this is a shift that's happening, and that's why I was asking about it. And, but you guys have personal, some of you have personal Gmail accounts. And, okay, so, and, and are you using your personal account for this, or are you using your institute? Yeah, and it works, right? I, I just want, I, I don't know if you could see, is this, should I make this font bigger? No, it's fine. Okay, okay. I, I'm sorry? I can see, but I can't hear when the people are in front of talking to the front when I talk loud. Okay, so make sure that when you're talking, I can hear you just fine wherever you are. So just make sure you turn and, 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 and shout. Just one thing I put on here was using Google services for a single source. So you're piling all your data in that one place, but also for search. I mean, have you guys all used Outlook email before? Okay, one of the things about Outlook is you make folders, right? You know, so class folder, that kind of thing. Well, for Google email, you can throw, it's one big folder, but search is so good, so you don't need folders. So this, that's, what, that's what I mean by single source and search. You've been very patient. You had your hand up. Yes? Huh. Processing time. Can you guys all hear that? This is a... This is something that I thought would be a lot bigger by now than it is. Um, do you remember when uh, restaurants sometimes tried to have non-cell phone spaces? It never worked. People, people complaining about cell phones wanted to bring their cell phones in. Um, you know, it's, but I think it's harder for people to do. Well, in part for what we just talked about. You know, I don't want to check my campus email, right? I don't want, but I do need to shop, or I want to look at this one Netflix movie. Exactly, exactly. Please. So when you say with the restaurant, well, when I'm with my friends out to eat or whatever we do, you can't get the salute, you can't get on the cell phone. You should have been with those other people. I, think ah. I mean, I was doing technology now because it's a technology event. event. But, I mean, if you want to Facebook with those other people, you should have been with those other people. Is anybody here a sociologist? <laughs> no. Uh, and who's the journalist? You're, you're in journalism, right? Or media? This, this is one of, oh, it's okay, you can keep eating. <laughs> I, I wait for people to eat and I pounce, right? Now. Um, one of the things that's amazing now is that we're seeing people, all these mores rapidly change and develop. I mean, almost month by month. So when you go to a movie theater, um, just look at how people are using phones. It's really interesting. Uh, um, you can, depending on how intrusive you want to be, you can try and guess their age and see. And people will be taking pictures of the screen or they'll be texting their friends. In fact, Hollywood used to have this process where they'd release movies on Friday, and then on Monday, they would check the count, see how many tickets they sold, and then decide if they need to increase or decrease the amount of theaters for, you know, how's it doing? It's doing badly? All right, we'll cut the theaters, cut our losses. It's doing great? More theaters. Now they decide Saturday morning. Because you have so many people using their phones and Twittering and saying, this is a great film, or... Man, another Stephanie Meyer movie, leave now. Or, you know, um, and it really has an impact right away. Um, yeah, please, please. So I just want to offer another perspective. Please, please. A live theater point. Yes, and I was hoping you would. And I love what you said about not, not being white on weekends. But I have to tell you, it bugs me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see a dance concert mm -hmm. play, and I'm trying to see the stage, but my, I'm being, I'm seeing the lights. Yeah. You know, we're, we're do they, do they, how often do you see them ask people to turn off their phones? Um, there's usually an announcement at the beginning of the, yeah. you know, turn off your cell phones and you're yeah. never make noise, that kind of thing. So, yeah. so, so things are not making noise, and also they're asking people not to record, like take right. uh, photographs and things. That's what I thought you were going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, but so people, they're not, there's nothing ringing, but they're check, they're texting, whatever they're doing, and yeah. the light, the light. It's, it's, you know. So I just 
there's a real place for being unwired. There really is a place to just be in the moment, completely in the moment, yeah. experiencing whatever that is, yeah. and also reflecting on it. I agree. That's what's evolving more is, is, I mean, what's happening is you're seeing people deliberately defying the, the ban. You know, they're, they're having the machines out there. Yeah. Um, do you get to fly very much these days? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's a, a terrible <laughs> thing. I mean, um, but one of the things I love watching is how people keep their phones or their devices on where they're not supposed to. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the ban is interesting because it it's not really a technological ban. The phones can't crash planes. It would have happened so far. Uh, it it would have already happened by now. But the main thing is it's, it's crowd control. Um, and, but yet, people will violate this. I, just personally, I can do this. Um, I have my Kindle has a black boundary. And I found once, I was reading a book very intensely, and I, I actually missed the announcement. And then the, the stewardesses didn't bother me. And it occurred to me that when they looked at me from the side, I must look like a rabbi. Or <laughs> <laughs> see, see, the, see the black binding? Yeah. And I can get away. <laughs> Old Russian men think I'm a priest all the time. The flip, but this isn't, don't try this. Because like, the flip side is Homeland Security always wants to get to know me better. <laughs> you mistaken for a random search. Random, right? You know? um, but, but no, I, I think that's a, that's a great example. Um, and I mean, have you seen this in movies? Have you ever seen cust uh, sorry, patrons shush each other or tell them to turn off the phone? I've, I've done that. The, yeah, keep an eye on this. This is, this is really evolving in all kinds of ways. I mean, texting developed in part in countries like Japan where they had very crowded, fairly polite spaces where people couldn't talk on phones. But texting was fine. So it evolved for that. So I, I watch right now. I mean, I, I think you're, to come back to the specific topic, that's a great answer to this. And it is hard. It's a discipline. And I, when, I'm, when I'm hiking on the long trail with my wife, I often find, God, you know, it's like a phantom limb. I really want to check something. I know, someone's twittering about me right now. I can feel it. You know? um, but that's, that's another way. What's another way you guys cope with all this stuff? Yeah, please. Are you? Well, I'll keep. Yeah. I started knitting this summer. And I'm not very good at it. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes, yes. 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 Do you know this uh, website? Just as a uh, ravelry. Yes, I'm a yeah. ravelry. Yeah. This is it's it's a knitting uh, site. And it's beautiful because they have tons of, 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 of yarn and cloth. And you can make, oh, they have terrible puns, too. You know, what's their favorite computer programming language on this site? Pearl. Pearl. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Please. Because big, I have a wife. Well, no, um, no, you're asking is the gender question, right? How is it elitist? Well, who did? I, 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 it, well, it is gender, and I guess that's Yeah, it's gender. Can, can I? Professional people can be doing other kinds of things. I mean, I don't know if anybody who knits except now Margaret. Okay, two people in this whole room. I crochet. Oh, yeah. I use the crochet, and my mother did that. You must knit. Yeah, no, no. Embroider, because she her face lit up with a big <laughs> smile. A craft group. Okay, okay. My other question is more pertinent to this discussion, and then I'll I'll back out. It's all right. Don't. Yes, yes. Which is a great passage. Oh, um, which story is it? Do you remember what story it is? I can't remember. I should know. Thank you.
Okay, let me. The, okay, first of all, don't back out because this is great. Could you guys all hear everything she was saying? No. Okay, so this because we're, we're cutting cross green across the room. So there's there's two things. I put, put Sherlock Holmes here because there's actually a great passage about information overload here, um, which is let me see if I can get this. Um, it's a discussion of information. Yeah, hang, hang on, hang, hang on. Uh, to carry the art of detection in its highest pitch, it is necessary the reasoner should be able to utilize all the facts which have come to his knowledge. And this in itself implies, as you will readily see, a possession of all knowledge, which, even in these days of free education and encyclopedias, <laughs> the 1890s, is a somewhat rare accomplishment. It is not so impossible, however, that a man should possess all knowledge which is likely to be useful to him in his work. And this and I have endeavored to do. What you see him doing in this scene is deliberately forgetting some stuff that doesn't matter to his, to his work. In fact, do you read mysteries? Yeah. So you know Nero Wolf, right? Yeah. So he actually has a response to this. Uh, no. <laughs> well, he, he says he says the, the, the memory increases with exercise, uh -huh. so you can keep remembering more stuff. Yeah. It's a great dialogue. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, yeah. the, the 20th century detective stories. Nero Wolf uh, yeah, yeah, no, has a response. To, yeah, and it. Oh yeah, I love this. This is a great story too. But this is, people have been thinking about this problem for a while. The first thing you were talking about was Ravelry and how would I know it? Um, well, well, hang on, what you, well, I, because I study this stuff. And, and so I, I look at Pinterest, even though 90% of Pinterest users in America are female, which is weird. No other country has this balance. If you go through Europe, 50-50, except in Italy, where it's about 60-40 with men. Um, but in this country, because of our gender culture, it skews that way, so I study it. Back channel, are you on Twitter? Yes. Yeah, tw tweet at me. Okay. Brian Alexander, you know, just be our YAN, and we're on there right now. Um, here's the thing to think about for information overload that may help a bit. Uh, if I can find this, um, there's a great image of this. See, here's a problem that we're not aware of. We've been looking at information for a long time in terms of just having information, just having access to it. But one of the things that we've forgotten is that we've had filters for a long time for information. So if you watch TV news, which I'd like to make fun of, but if, if you watch TV news, that's a filtering mechanism. I mean, all the CNN, Fox, MSNBC, they look at the world of news and they filter it for you. They're professional journalists and they sift it out. So they see what you think you should know. I mean, newspaper journalists do this all the time. And we're kind of accustomed to those filters. We don't even think about them as filters anymore. We're just used to it. Librarians are terrific filters. They are gateways between you and the world of books and other media. That's their job, to pick out what they need to have. Um, academics, when we make a syllabus, we're doing the same exact thing. We're telling the students what they need to know in this intro bio class or this advanced physiology class or French history class or whatever. Now what's happening is we have to make new filters. This is a phrase that's worth thinking about. It's not information overload, it's filter failure. So if you feel you have too much, well, in many ways your filters are broken. That's okay. So figure out how to refilter things. And there are a lot of ways of doing this. So with that reframing, what are your filters now? for information. I don't mean just about technology, but information in general, including your profession. So for example, the uh, APA, is that a useful filter for you right now? Interesting, interesting. How about professional journals? I mean, do they have a news item, that you f a news function that you find useful? Are we questions making sense here? Uh-huh. 
something catches my eye, ah. and I'll zoom in on that one particular thing, but a uh -huh. lot of it I just kind of let it scroll and it's ah. going all day long. But that, that helps me kind of filter because after a while it does get overwhelming. Let me, let me pause you two guys, because you guys are like astronauts from the future here. I, I just want to explain what they've done. This is a thing that we sometimes call social media curation, which is they've used social media tools as filters for their professional work. So this guy is checking blogs on philosophy, presumably, right, and, and looking for papers, because the other bloggers will find it. They'll say, oh, here's an interesting paper you should read. Uh, here's a good paper, or here's a paper you shouldn't read. Right, which is very important, <laughs> and things not to do. So you're using blogs for this, and you've trained your social bookmarking tool, Symbolo, by giving you the keyword terms to search for, right? Which for you is social work. So that's, you're making filters using these tools. Here's another one. Do you guys use Google Alerts for email for this? Have you heard of this? This is a fun thing. I'll show you. This is, this is remarkably easy to do. What Google will do is they'll search the web for you while you sleep for certain keywords. So here's an example. Okay, well, this is. So here's the, how do you set it up? When I say it's easy, I don't mean like when technologists say easy, they're usually lying outright. But, but, but this is actually simple. A search query term. So, you know, say you're interested in, um, well, Nigeria, right? Put in Nigeria. And it will tell you anything, or uh, maybe I'm just looking for news, maybe video, right? And I can also, it will email me at certain times. So I can get it once a day. It'll email me with everything it finds in that net, or once a week, or whatever it happens, depending on how vital this is for you. And then I can sift if I want only the best answers or everything, and to me. So here are a couple of things I'm searching for right now. Whoops, sorry. And these might not be that useful for you to see, but here are a couple of terms. <laughs> Title of my book. <laughs> I'm always looking for that. Um, because I want to see what people are saying about it, so I know, which is really useful. My name. Always do this. I mean, Googling yourself sounds like something that's illegal in Georgia, but, <laughs> but you've got to do this because other people will Google you, right? Um, we had a fight with our elementary school principal and ended up firing her. And um, she emailed me asking that I remove every reference to her on the web that I had made. Uh, I was the town blogger, and so the references were things like meeting tonight with the principal. But if you Googled her, those were the only terms that came up. And she didn't want that. Right? So she found out by self-Googling. So think about what your students will, publishers will, parents will Google and see her. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, then, it's, then the filters need to get better. Well, then you, then you have to, that's, that's, the quick and, that's the down and dirty part of this, where you have to, you know, where you have to adjust. Uh, I'll show you if you want. This is, okay, this is going to be horrifying. What I'm going to show you now is a, is a, is a cry for help. No, no. This is, this is my RSS reading, which is, whoop, should already have me in here. And it will fall asleep as we go. OK, so on the left are the feeds I follow. And there's quite a few. <laughs> but in part, I'm a professional full-time researcher. So I read a lot. I have to. This is how I know about Ravelry, right? Also, a lot of these end up being redundant. They're repetitious. But that's because I'm tracking it. Think, think about for journalism, right? I mean, I'm tracking to see where a story ends up. But also, futurism, one of the things you look for are repetitions. The more hits on something, the more repetitions of it tells you it might be more important. So a lot of these I can just skim for repetition. This is too much. I mean, I need to cut it down, right? Um, but, but that's my fault in many ways. I just need to reduce it a bit. Yeah, please. 
I'll explain. Yeah. We mentioned this before, and I'll explain this. This is a frustrating technology for me because I think it's extremely powerful and really useful. Um, but it's one step too geeky to use. You've already seen this technology already, and you might not have known about it. I'll show you what I mean. Here's CNN.com, which I don't recommend for news, but here it is. You recognize the site, right? If you scroll down through the site, you see a whole bunch of content items. And way down here, you see the word RSS. RSS stands for really simple syndication. And what it does is a, it makes a website into a clipping service for you. So if I click on this, hang on, this is going to sound weird. This is going to sound weird, but it's there. And if you look at the word RSS, you will find it on every news site in the world, every major one, and on all blogs. It'll either have the word RSS or syndicate or XML. Hang on, I know this sounds geeky, just, just this will make sense. What they do is the site has feeds for you. So behind the scenes, without any humans involved, they take the news items and they kind of line them up into news items for you, little bite-sized things. Now, you can find that, like I just did by clicking on RSS, and then I can paste it into a tool called an RSS reader. So here, I'll go to the feeds for Inside Higher Ed, which you guys all know. And I'll, extreme, I'll expand the font again. I'm sorry for being so small. And if you just look quickly, uh, University of Essex Marketing Memo, National Center for Campus Public Safety, blah, 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 Michigan State Congressional Study. So this is like the front page sucked through a straw of Inside Higher Ed. Now, why would I do this? You know, this seems kind of ugly and ungainly. Well, if I click on one of these, I get the whole thing, which is handy. But what I've done is I've taken a bunch of different RSS feeds, and I've put them into folders based on what I need today. So this is my daily morning news read, my essential one. And it's right there. I also have, because I research certain things, right, I have higher education. And these are a bunch of blogs that I follow. And this is actually pretty easy to use. I don't know if you can, this is hard to look at, but do you see how some of these are bold and some are not? Bold means there's something new for me. If my laptop bursts into flames right now, oh my god, I can grab your machine, log in, and it will be right at this spot. It will remember it, which is pretty handy. I mean, my laptop doesn't usually burst into flames, but it's pretty handy to have. So I can make organizations for whatever topics I've got. So I've got a library topic. I don't have a knitting topic. I could. I have a topic for Vermont, because I live there. And then I organize these how I see fit. I know this sounds kind of crazy looking, but the end result is like a clipping service that you make yourself for free. I'm not recommending that everyone do this right now because the best tool in the world for doing it just shut down. And there isn't really a good replacement. Forgive me, I can't remember your name. Was just talking about this. We are all, like a lot of people, using a tool called Google Reader. Google turned it off. There are a bunch of replacements, and they're not nearly as good. So I can't, personally, I can't recommend any one of them right now. This one is probably the least bad one. It's called Dig Reader. H hang on one second, just one second. There's another one that you mentioned, which looks nice, which you might want to try, called Feedly. I'm sorry this is taking a minute, unless I killed it by touching it. <coughs> Feedly, come back. That's the thing about the web. The more people that are looking at it, the slower it moves. Oh, here we go. You saw that. Why are you taking so long? Yeah, I got it on my phone. I can pass this around if you want. <laughs> While it's coming up. Feedly. Yeah, F-E-E-D. 
Okay, see, it looks nicer because it's got, it, ha it looks more like a magazine. It, it has pictures. So here, if I, uh, so when I click on the inside higher ed, see, it looks nicer. Same articles, it just adds pictures to them. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. But that's just personal, right? You know. So I, I don't want to get too far on this. I'm glad you asked because this is a technology that I'm very fond of and I think it'll come back. I think people will have better tools for it. Uh, and I think if you want to try it for the first time, try Feedly because you can use it on your phone. You can use it on the web. It's free. It's pretty simple to look at. Um, give, it a, give it a shot because if imagine I don't, I don't know the social work field very well. Right? But I could imagine making a category of, say, researchers in, in social work and their news items. And another one might be public policy shifts. Right. Another one might be your students who might be writing about this. I'm just making this up. Right? And another category might be food, because you like cooking. And then you can look at that when you want to. Right? I have a food item, which I won't share with you because it's too horrifying. Um, but you can, make, you can mix and match this yourself. So I think give it a few months, talk to your IT people and these librarians, and let, let them, have them tell you when this is ready, when this gets good enough to use. And if you're curious, try Feedly now. Yeah, I'm sorry to make you wait. Okay, I just, um, speaking of something Rob mentioned, and as well as the tools, yeah. I really like it because it, um, because you can see the things that are in the category and things that are in the category. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then, if you can, take a day and not look at it. And then, if you connect it to what you're saying, you're following your professional organizations. Right, so that's why I was asking about the American Philosophical Association. Right? You know, so you can use them for that. Um, I mean, Twitter works in many ways better now as, as a feed for that. Remember the columns I had? You, know, you can make these for, I mean, that's one way of, of building a filter. Um, so you can use RSS if you like. You can use Twitter if you like. I found Facebook has a limited value for that. It really depends on who you know on Facebook. I, I don't mean that to sound creepy. It just means how often do people that you want to follow use Facebook to talk about their professional work? I mean, you're, I'm, I'm very bad in a Facebook. I talk about both professional and personal stuff. So it could be a, here's a picture of my dog. Doesn't she look like she needs a brain transplant? And then, because she does, because she's a moron. But then, but then I'll have a picture, or then I'll have a link to a story about high red financing. And I just get kind of good conversations. That's just the people I know. It depends on you. It's really up to you. But Think about it when we're talking about being cheap. Everything we talked about is free. But also, I think about this as the benefit of being lazy. Here's why. I'm a politics junkie. Anybody else here a news junkie? Okay, I, I'm with you. I'm with you, brothers and sisters. I understand. Reformed. Reformed. Oh, I can't talk to you. But, but here's something that I do. Because I love, I love finding out about current events. I find people who are more obsessed than I am. And I let them do work for me for free. So here, for example, I'm pretty green. I, whoops. Um, I'm pretty green. I follow a lot of environmental news. So over here, I made a folder on ecological stuff. And here are a bunch of different bloggers who write about it. So those guys, whatever I do, no matter what I do, 
they will keep doing this stuff. <laughs> They'll write about, you know, here's a, here's a wonderful weather blogger, here's a farmer I know, here's a political organization by a friend of mine. And so they'll sift the world for me. And I think that's pretty handy. <laughs> uh, so if um, I, I still, I love teaching argumentative writing. <clears throat> so I have left-wing politics and right-wing politics together. Um, so I can sift what they're saying at the same time, right? Um, but those guys are fanatics. And some of them are actually professionals, because some bloggers actually make enough money to, to do that full time. So great, I'll benefit from their work. I'm glad to, and they're happy to, because they want people to view. So that's another way of saving time. Let me ask again, those are some technologies. You mentioned blogs, you mentioned um, your social bookmarking tool. We talked about RSS. What other, what other filters do you use? Uh, here's a better way of asking it. What non-technological filters do you use? Shopping at the mall. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Because they all, they're also all, all filters, right? For clothes, fashion is an incredibly finely grained filter, right? They have to do this. Um, go to a bookstore in the mall, kind of shouldn't. But, but if you do, it's an interesting way of looking at bestsellers because they actually know what bestsellers are, not like the New York Times. You know, they'll have things that people won't necessarily be talking about. I know, I know. But, but businesses are terrific at this. That's one of the reasons we outsource so much stuff. How else? Who else? What else do you use that isn't technology for a filter? So I was asking about your professional associations. Those are not technological filters per se, right? Going to galleries. Yeah. That's one of their key mechanisms, right? I mean, even when they're doing a single person's stuff, they still say no to some of it, right? Here's something else, too. Other people. You professors, look in the back row of those librarians, especially the two super geeky ladies at either end. Those guys are human filters. I mean, you heard what she was saying about RSS and her analysis. And during the break, I was bugging the heck out of this poor woman. I mean, they know a lot of stuff. And you can exploit them. Um, how do I find out my research? Huh, other people's children. I stalk them. <laughs> That's great. I mean, because watching children use technology is mind-blowing. I mean, if you think you're not sure about 18-year-olds now, look at four-year-olds. These guys are from another planet, right? I mean, and that's fascinating. Um, I go through any public environment. One of the things I do is I, I look to see what people are holding. I, I was in Manhattan taking my son for a trip, and I was watching what people were taking photographs with. And it was interesting. What do you think the overwhelming device was? Smartphones. Smartphones. See, this is Manhattan, right? Because I, I know there's a certain class dynamic involved. And I did see more than a few tablets being used for photographs, but only a few because they're kind of hard to take photos, because they're heavy, right? Um, and then I saw a couple of <clears throat> nice cameras. Um, but that's useful for me to see. I mean, so other people are great filters. Your departmental colleagues are filters. That's what departments do, in part. Right? They help tell you, you think about curriculum reform. Are we going to change our offerings next year? They have to do that. So think filters. That can help you stay sane. Even if, you filter, if your filter is too good at bringing in stuff. You know? Um, then you adjust. Or you get used to that fact and say, that's part of the fire hose of this condition. All right. I want to shift ground to talk about something else, but do you have any other thoughts about information overload? Any other concerns? Yes, please. Just figuring out what an incredible resource Has, wait, you're, you're at Morehouse. You're at? Do you? Ah. I was, you beat me to it. <clears throat> the library world since the 1980s has had something called information literacy or information fluency. The, in the 1980s, librarians were way ahead of the rest of us. They came up with this idea that digital technology was going to be big, they're right, and that it was going to be hard to tell what was good and what was not. And so they came up with a whole bunch of pedagogies and curricula for doing this. And libraries are very passionate about this. And they have a whole set of tools for how to do this. So when, when you pull down a news source, I mean, I've, in RSS, I've vetted all these myself. And I've, I ditched the ones that don't work very much for me anymore. But there's always this problem, you know? Like for news, one of my favorite insane news sources is Russia Today, because it is insane. I don't know if you know these guys. This is like Russia's version of CNN slash Fox slash MSNBC. <clears throat> and they're, they're kind of random. So they'll care just about anybody. They had uh, uh, the WikiLeaks guy. 
uh, Julian Assange was running a talk show for them. Um, but I know they're not that reliable. I mean, if they have a story, I'll look at it, but then I'll look for confirmation somewhere else, just because. But I'm aware of that because I'm a news person the same way. So in art, if I were to ask you about news and art, you'd be a person to talk to to tell me what was good and what wasn't. But there are a whole series of other tools you use. You know, like .com sites tend to be a bit more suspicious and .edu sites and that kind of thing. But that practice is important. That practice is very important. Other thoughts, other questions? Got to change gears in a big way right now. We have to change things into a very, very different topic. See, I'm not showing you pictures. That was partly deliberate <clears throat> because we have to talk about showing pictures. Tell me about visual literacy. What are you guys doing and working on in terms of visual literacy now? What does this mean to you? What kind of things are you working on? I don't mean your personal lives now. I'm talking about specifically your professional lives. Don't be shy. Yes. You're so shy normally, right? That was good. She called on you. Did you see that? That was good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, for, uh, I mean, to show different uh, regions in the world, uh, in teaching the students about the dispersal of people of African descent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether we are talking about the uh, Black Atlantic War, mm -hmm. the uh, Indian Ocean War, mm -hmm. uh, it helps to get you know, the students to grasp the. Yeah. Yes. Uh, our sense of uh, immediacy uh, that the teacher may not be able to keep because what you're saying is basically, you know, uh, videos of showing the, of showing the student uh, the direct of the movement. You know, yes. And, you know, the facts that they uh, Absolutely. Beloved. Uh, no. <laughs> no, and Messi. Oh. Huh. Messi. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I had to go uh, on the internet looking for interviews that you know, mm -hmm. she had done to try to help me uh, get the student to have uh, uh, the auto, you know, contextualize our work. Yes. In their papers and in class, they can use that. Let me, this is, and you teach history, right? No, no, no. <laughs> the African, the That's right, excuse me, excuse me, yes. Um, let me just grab two of these key points that, that you mentioned, and, and conveniently, Google Images uh, has them in one spot. I don't know if you, know, if you guys use Google Image searches. The, there are two main problems with Google Image searches. One is there's no copyright control. 
So you can find lots of copyright images which you may or <coughs> may not want to use. That's one. The other is the images sometimes are smaller than is useful. So they all look pretty decent here. When you actually click on them, they may be thumbnails or smaller. So there's just two cautions. Just so I just Googled middle, middle passage. And here are two examples of what you're talking about. Here's a map of uh, the slave trade. Did you hear about the Texas Board of Ed last week? They were trying to redefine in their textbook the term slave trade as triangular trade. Atlantic. Texas, right? But Texas, right? But but here's the you gotta do something. But here's here is so it comes up with a map, but also these images which are chilling as well as instructive. Right? So for you, for this particular topic, absolutely. These are very powerful. Um, so in your class, in your class is, these are two of the visual aid plus the video that you're talking about. How about the rest of you guys? Yes, please. For dance history. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 You got. You have to. You got to do that. That's huge. Oh, nice. Students, you know, see different writing styles, see the philosophy of the media organization, you know, depending on what movie, subject-verb agreement. Yes. Just to reinforce the relevancy of their textbook to the world they live in. And I also will pull up, in particular in the ethics and media class, I will pull up ethics work that's being done at another university. Hmm. So that they can see what their contemporaries are doing in their classes. Uh, it may be uh, notes from a lecture from another professor. Nice. Or, or something that's been written by another student. Yeah, that yeah. Find that's relevant to something that we're discussing. And have them uh, we discuss it in class or have them do uh -huh. a homework uh -huh. assignment. Or I send them to my colleagues here at the library. Yes. I love the way that you went from images to web pages, <laughs> because web pages are visual mm -hmm. you know, form. I mean, even if they're, even this is mostly text, but but most web pages. When I pull up CNN, you saw slab of a picture, right? I mean, we your own campus websites probably have at least one or three or five pictures. So, and they are visual, uh, visual media. Yeah, please. I work with the, um, the first year writing portfolio as well. Okay. I can't talk very much louder than uh, kind of local paralysis. Her throat, her throat hurts. I'll repeat it back to her. Do, do you guys have a, um, a formal e-portfolio strategy? Yes, we do. What, what technology are you running for that? Uh, we are using e-portfolio to talk to my Oh, good. Yes. Good. So, um, with that, what's so interesting is that those this is a very image saturated culture. Yes. Students, their paper portfolio is very much like the electronic portfolio. So one of the things that we can find to do is figure out how to get them to think in terms of images. Uh, if you Stop, stop, stop. You, 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 I feel so bad for you because you're. Through. Stop, stop. Don't say anymore. It sounds awful. Okay, let me, let me repeat what, what, what you said. So, so, our poor suffering colleague sounds like she's suffering. Um, do you need water or anything? You, you, all right. Uh, I was talking about using images in e portfolios. You guys all know e portfolios? The idea? Have you, I don't know if you guys all have these in your institutions, but this is 
an, e an e-portfolio, take off the e, right, is, the, is a portfolio of student writing, which is accumulated over time. And they're accumulated using a digital tool. So students get to have samples of their writing from class after class, year after year. So when they graduate, they can do something with this. They can, they can, they can pull the best parts off of it and use it to apply to grad school or, to a, uh, or for a job. And while they're in school, instructors can look back at their work to see what they, you know, where they've come from, what they're doing. And the students get this wonderful pedagogy of reflecting on their writing, which is really very, very powerful. And it gets away from the problem of, of isolated classes as silos without a lot of continuity. Uh, and there, if you Google the term ePortfolio, there are a bunch of different uh, platforms for doing it. There's actually a terrific organization called ABLE, which supports it right now. Um, thank you for asking. Did that make sense? You weren't? OK. Um, so one of the things that, that you mentioned was the uh, defining iconic images. Uh, I used to teach a class on the Vietnam War. And it was really fascinating to show certain images at different audiences and to see who went, <gasps> and who went, huh. I mean, it did give me more gray hairs than I you know, thought I had. Um, but you can use iconographic images that way. You can also um, use them to respond to the fact that increasingly students come to you in an image-saturated culture. I think it's a great phrase. Take a look at a computer game. I haven't talked about games yet. But one of the things about games is that they are, are powerfully visual. And the more expensive, powerful games are Hollywood quality images. The difference is people don't play them for two hours. They play them for 40 hours or 100. So students come to you with images all over the place. And one of the reasons I don't like TV news is it relies too heavily on images. But, and, but students come to you, that's the reality. So you get to respond. And then you can see what kind of images they include in their portfolios. OK, we've got maps, images used for different impacts uh, in different ways. We have web pages for comparisons, images in portfolios, iconic images, image saturated culture. How else you got? You use visualizations every day because you're a scientist and you need to show people bodies and anatomy, right? It's kind of the basic nuts and bolts of it. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Which we still use. Yes. But now trying to make sure that we can take advantage of the technology. So I generally have an app discussion during orientation. And so one of those, I'm more on the nervous system now, is 3D brain. Yes. And so the students can pick that up and it just allows them to, um, I can put it up on the overhead. Well, on the overhead projector. Or, the, or the projector, but it allows them to even use their finger. Fingers nice. manipulate the brain, quiz themselves. They can then do a label if they'd like. And oh, I nice. am able to get the, uh, well, if you click info, it gives you a summary. But the one thing I like is it provides case studies and huh. there um, are links to articles that support the information that's being shown. Oh, good. And the American Psych uh, Physiological Psych Association has even done a nice summary of classic articles. Because I think sometimes when they're oh. reading the text information, just fell from the sky, but right. it allows right. us to then go to the primary, primary sources to then re be able to appreciate the scientific method that gave rise to those theories and concepts. Go, go back to that. Go back to that. To the, to the brain. To the 3D brain. Okay. And then what I do is if we talk about the cerebellum and we understand the physiology, then I go to YouTube to pull up the pathophysiology of someone who had a cerebellum stroke so that they can see how the gait would change in that person to someone who had a normal functioning um, brain. And so it allows them to then be able to understand the information in a different context and do more comparison and analysis. So. Um, let me just act, would you mind passing that around? Oh. Mobile devices aren't a major topic for today. For this, for this workshop, but you can't get away from them. And we've already talked about them in terms of multitasking. But what I'd like to do, if, if I could, if you, if you don't mind, because it's your iPad. This is a pedagogy that we found with tablet computers, which is that an instructor can, pass, can find something and pass it around a room. You can do this with a laptop, but a laptop like yours or mine is bulky. And the other thing is can, it blocks things out, right? Um, and you remember, remember the briefcases? You could do that, you know, hide behind a briefcase? Well, laptops have that effect. And I, I found again and again in meetings, the minute you shift from a laptop to a tablet, people become more personable, which isn't always good. <laughs> but, but, but that barrier is down. 
um, there's a prophet, uh, DePaul, I've worked with, who called, who's a classicist, and he calls this passing the sun um, because he loves the idea of finding something and handing it around. And then, of course, better than that, a student finds something and says, I think you guys should see this and, and pass it around. I, it's, a low, it's a kind of low-tech, easy pedagogy, but I th it's a pretty handy one. So brain visualization. So visualization apps. So you have programs that are all about visualization, and certain fields have these. And then links to other media, uh, links to other typos um, as part of that. What else are you guys doing? This is great. You can't, I, I, I had to look up visual literacy because we, we don't do anything without visual images. And so I could not even think yeah. of being in an environment that didn't have visual images. Well, you're, that's, that's your field, you know, I, I mean, but, but here, this is interesting. When you take a, were you at the previous workshop on, on this? No. Uh, nor was I. I mean, I have the materials, but this is interesting. Take a look at this. If you search for the term, uh, visual literacy. It dates back to the 70s. It came up when people were talking about media literacy. Uh, so the idea of being skeptical and critical of images. But look at this, what's interesting. I've got a whole raft of, of sources and resources on this. There's a very famous one from Pomona College, um, which is really, really detailed. But look what it's about. Can you, can you see that? It's actually about individual pieces of images. So about what lines are, what dots are. So it's different from like an iconic image. It's actually saying, you know, how does an image work? And that's, okay, there's that, which of course in your field, naturally you're, you're, you're very familiar with. But then let's take a look at, um, from the University of Puget Sound. There's combines visual literacy associations with questions about skepticism and being able to appreciate and understand visual items like photographs, how to interpret and analyze a photograph. So this is, this is different from breaking it down to say, okay, how does a composition work? How does this arrange lines? Here it's, you know, how do you trust this image? What does it portray? What does it tell you about the photographer? That's another way of looking at images. And then, and then we have this new problem or this new way of looking at it where you can think about it in terms of how individual students, what they should have um, as skills when they leave your classroom. So let me expand this a bit. This is from the, uh, um, the American Library Association. Check this out. In an interdisciplinary, higher education environment, a visually literate individual is able to determine the nature and extent of the visual materials needed. That's a very different thing. So for your e-portfolio, I'm doing a paper on Tupac. What pictures do I need? How many? Find and assess needed images. So back to the library goal of finding information. Right? Um, interpret and analyze. There's that picture again. Evaluate images and their sources. Use them. Design and create. Back to the producer and consumer dynamic again. And then, small point, understand many of the ethical, legal, social, and economic issues starting the creation and use of images. So now we get meta and figure who's allowed to make images. Who owns Flickr images? What is copyright? I mean, for me, this looks like a major. <laughs> Not one skill that a biology student graduates with, but this looks like a visual resources major. But all of this together, this is huge. Do, do these things look familiar to you guys? I mean, do they appear in, in your classes? <laughs> for which classes? Well, yeah, there you go. The same docs uh -huh. are used for both the information and visual literacy. Yes. And I got it out of this from a workshop in this library. It sounds familiar. It sounds familiar. So you've got that. How about the rest of you guys? Does this sound familiar? Yeah, please. Well, I use business for vocabulary development. So we go through um, some of the vocabulary words, and then we go back Great. To Great. Oh, nice.
Yeah. And around the march on Washington. Yeah. Oh, please let me know how this goes. Uh, Starfight is uh, uh, a ser I'm showing you all this stuff, right? And all these links are in the wiki, so you don't have to feel totally overwhelmed. Um, I'm a filter today, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and you guys are too. But one of the things that Starfight lets you do is it lets you haul different bits of the web as image chunks and put them in order to tell a story. So we had an argument on Twitter, about 20 of us, um, about adjunct, the adjunct economics and medical care for faculty. So there's this interesting uh, provocative argument, which was that American academia has reduced the amount of tenure track jobs in part to pay for the increased compensation of the tenure track jobs, that the majority of faculty are now adjunct because of the compensation cost. So there's a furious argument that's going back and forth and back and forth. So I went into Storify, typed in uh, a couple of those uh, Twitter handles, and then just hauled out, I mean, just drag and drop those different tweets, saved it, and we had an argument right there. Actually, it was easier to do than it was for me to tell you, because it was all just going like that. And your students can do this right away for March on Washington, you said? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, so, yeah. I was surprised that most of them had different language, so they're going to compile it and create something. Really? Sweet. Oh, I'd love to see it. I would love to see it. Um, I mean, so you can, here, uh, privacy again. Um, you know, you can make something private or public mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And then we could search for something. So I will search for MLK through Flickr right now, just quickly. And no, that's that's too big. Let me do this. No, I won't because that's for Flickr. There probably aren't any images for that. So I'm just going to do Google. Oh, okay. Here's something from Washington City Paper. <laughs> Clonk. Popular stories from Washington Post. And I'm just kind of doing this at random, but. And then, uh, and you can organize it you put it in over here. yep, yep. And in fact, let me let me search for Twitter to see what people have said. March in Washington to say vote no to war against Syria. Okay, and commemorating the march in Washington. Okay, so here are four pieces. I can tell a story. All right, now we're looking at the anniversary, and here is hey, people are using new technology to commemorate it. And here are some examples of articles. And the March on Washington is still a live presence because it's connected to the prospective war on Syria. How quick was that? And I, I'm not even thinking hard. Unlike you, I'm not as expert in, in the subject matter. But I could be one of your students and do this right? that quickly. And you can add a title and stuff like that. Starify. Pretty handy. Do you have to yeah. No, no. Go, great question. No. I just had to be logged into, um, you can either make a Storify account or you can log in via Twitter, which is what I did, or Facebook. Um, that, that was pretty quick. No, I, I, I think this is, this is pretty handy. In fact, one problem with Twitter is that Twitter moves so quickly that conversations recede into the past. So people will often, it's a verb now, they'll Storify a Twitter conversation. Imagine saying that out loud 10 years ago. People would have thought you'd had Tourette's, right? But, no, <laughs> but you can Storify a Twitter conversation and then save it. So if this was good, if I wanted to share this, I can just save this and I have a URL which I can email my professor. Let me, um, in the interest of time, I want to show you a couple of images and a couple of resources. Uh, I'm sorry, a couple of visual projects that you might find powerful and interesting, and then some resources that you might find useful. Just so you know, you guys should feel great about the thinking you're doing with visual, Im visual literacy, I'm teaching a class on it, obviously, but using it in different ways. Most campuses where I go, the conversation is not at that level. I mean, artists, people in art, are obviously at that, because that's a profession. It's like talking about computing, you go to computer scientists. Uh, you know. But the rest of you guys, 
talking about using images to teach middle passage and, and maps, this is really important. Right? You guys should feel good about this. Here are a couple of things. This is a uh, a website um, maintained by some sociologists that I really recommend if you're interested in teaching about images. So this is the sense where you talk about what images mean uh, at the larger sense. So not at the look at the composition of that photograph, look at the lighting, not at that level, but the level of what does this mean about uh, society. It's called sociological images. And you can scroll through here and find a whole bunch of really teachable images for everything. For, I mean, it's a feminist site, so there's a lot about body image and a lot about uh, fashion and, of course, food. But you can work through here and find a ton of really, in yeah. And because this is social, a lot of these are commented on. So you can grab comments and use these. So this is one, I think, it, again, in the interest of being cheap, here is a free site that you can use. And you don't have to make anything. It's right there. Now, here's something else. Um, I was talking with one of you about uh, Professor Ed Ayers, who is a historian. And he, at the University of Richmond, he has a, pr a team that works on doing digital humanities visualizations. Digital humanities is basically what it says, the whole field of using digital technologies to advance the humanities. This is one of their projects, which I just find mind-blowing. And I work with this a lot. I'm not a historian, unfortunately. I love history. And I know more about the rest of the world than I do about American history. So I look at American history, I feel like a 12th grader. Um, this is a project about emancipation during the Civil War and right afterwards. Let me explain how this works. What it's done is it's taken what are called, again, I'm not a historian, I'm not a professional in this, emancipation events. Any event when one or more black slaves were freed. We call these events because they're documented in different ways. All these red needles or red dots give you examples of them. But what you can do here, first of all, without doing anything fancy, is as a map, think about your use of maps to teach American history, is you can just go through this and look through the, the distribution of where these happened, which is interesting. And for example, I'd be naively interested in the coastline. What does that mean, right? I mean, how many slaves, for example, escaped because they were on the coast and were able to run to northern ships that were docked offshore? I don't know. But as a student, I'd be curious. And here, right, you'd wonder what that means. Why so many in northeastern Virginia? Were, was it, were they tied to the battles that kept ebbing and flowing there? I don't know. But I can do something else. I can add and subtract information. So here. This is just the events. The blue pins are Union Army locations. So one theory is that how, how strong a role did the Union Army play in liberating slaves? You know, was it major or minor? That's a thing you can talk about. So you can map and see where they were. Now, you can also watch this in time. So you start, and you can set whatever chronology you want. So let's go to January 1861. And you can follow it. And again, I'd wonder, are these revolts? Or are they just a couple of people running away? But they're in the Deep South, where there aren't any Union armies. That's interesting. Oh, wait, there's a bunch here where the military campaigns were. It's 61, OK. Huh. Again, why here? I don't know, but I'd be interested to find out. 62, let's leap forward. And because this is a, this is a visualization a kind of video, you can hit pause, rewind, move around. So here's Gettysburg, about the time of the Battle of Gettysburg which we just had this big you know, anniversary for. So you'd wonder, what's the state of affairs? Oh, here. Let's put the legality of slavery overlay, where slavery was legal and where it was illegal. <laughs> That's interesting. 
And you can skip forward to the end of the war. Whoop. I can break it. <laughs> yeah, hang on. It's rebuilding. So you go to the end of the war. And now I begin to wonder, here's the Union campaign. I think this is actually, this is Sherman, right? I wonder how many slaves were emancipated by Sherman. I actually don't know. Grant's campaigns down the Mississippi. Like I said, you can look at this forever. This is a really great visualization. But I'm a newbie to this particular part of historiography. I can learn. I'm an 18-year-old in the classroom in History 101. I can learn a lot. Or I'm a Civil War historian. I know about these topics, but I can see them literally in a new light. Visualization. Right? Here's a different one. You guys all see this map from last week? Oh, this is an astonishing map. I'm a text person, by the way. So when people can do images well, I'm just gobsmacked. OK. This is using census data from 2010. And hang on to your hats, because this is amazing. Every dot is one person. This image is six gig of bytes of memory. And they're color coded, interestingly. White people are blue, black are light green, Asian red, Hispanic, is that beige? Yeah. So. I lived a long time. I'm a man. It's like black or white, green, that's about it. That's as far as I go. So here, let's take a look at uh, Detroit, for example. Now, do you see all the, all the, the wash of colors? Because that's, it's, the map is rebuilding. Let me zoom in. Yeah. This is the, like the number of data points. There are 320 million data points in this map. <laughs> so if you don't know Detroit, <clears throat> this, if you do know Detroit, this comes as no surprise. But if you want a visualization of the term color line, and then this is interesting too. Huh. Of course, of course. Hang on. Am I in the wrong town? Thank you. Thanks. There's no, um, unfortunately, it doesn't have any uh, cartographic data. It doesn't have any. So, see this? So this is pretty astonishing to look at. And now, if you want, let's zoom out all the way out. Look at the whole US. And look at the distribution of blacks here. Look at Asians. Look at the islands of Asian population. And then look at the Hispanic population. I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, population density, yeah, definitely. Like the empty quarter right here. Look at this. Um, yeah. Or now, if you want to, if you want to feel optimistic about life, look at New York City. Look at the, it's tangled up. And now you can zoom in to different blocks <laughs> and neighborhoods, but this is in many ways kind of the ideal melting pot image, right? I mean, it's, it's intertwined in many ways. Visualization, now, hang on a second. Producer versus consumer, you don't have to make this map. Go, if you want, fabulous. I mean, this is a lot of work by a professional cartographer. But think of the classes you can use this in, right? I mean, think about diaspora, right? Thinking about literature. Um, if you're talking about oh, visual literacy, here you go, have fun. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of material you can do with this. In fact, do you know the uh, uh, Lewis and Clark um, 
College has a great American sculpture um, archive. It's wonderful, wonderful. And they've, they've digitized it, put it all up on the web, and they've mapped it to where all the images come from. It'd be fun to map that onto this, for example. Now, how far back does this census data come? It's 2010. No, but I'm saying, do they have any for previous, you know, like in the I don't know. Way, yeah, that, see, that would be awesome to do. I don't no, know. I'm talking about like, like back in the early 1900s. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Now, Google Earth does have historical maps included. Not Google Maps, but Google Earth. And you can add and subtract those maps. And some of those may be census maps. I, I haven't looked for that, but, but it'd be fabulous to check. I mean, look at, you know, well, here. I mean, I'd wonder about the Great Migration. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> and can you, you know, this big green belt here, right? It's what I should have done first. But <laughs> Here. But I want, but, but the simplicity of this to start with. Um, now, let's get crazy meta for a minute. I love this. I love it. So you guys all recognize this symbol. Even if you're a humanist, you recognize this symbol. This is one of the great triumphs of Russian science, right? 19th century Russian scientists are awesome. Yeah, oh, people love using this. For, and there's a periodic table of storytelling, which is very fun. But this is a periodic table of visualization methods. So, look. so here's a metro map. Story template, graphic facilitation, cartoon, rich picture, knowledge map. Learning map, info mural, continuum. So if you're interested in, in visualization and you want to apply it to your work, think about just going through this table for inspiration. Square opposites. Venn diagram. And you guys have you'll recognize half of these from your own life, right? But just having it all in one spot, and some of these you might not. Some of these are bizarre. Or only very specifically targeted on a discipline. Anyway, I thought you might enjoy this. Now, I think what you might enjoy more, hang on a second, I've got to interrupt, is eating food. Because I am between you and your lunch. I've taken you about 12 minutes over. And you know how I could figure this out? Here's a fun thing for you. Here's a website. It's called Time Is. So you can always use that if you want. <laughs> um, we've got an hour scheduled for lunch. Um, I would recommend that even though we've gone 13 minutes over, sorry, um, that you come back at 1. Uh, come back earlier if you want. I'll be here most of the time. Um, think about what we've been talking about and how it can apply to your classes. Think about what your, your colleagues have been doing. Right? And then when we come back, we're going to be talking more about different literacies.